Um, same thing with, with news media. Uh, I encourage you to do that too. Don't take any story that's either in newsprint or on cable television. Unless you really fully understand the people that are presenting it. Because nine times out of ten, it's not all what it seems to be. Okay, It's the same in, in literature as it is in modern day life. So the best advice that I, Professor Davis, can give you, the applicability of using this tool, how is this going to benefit me in my life? It causes you a moment of pause after reading something or after hearing something, especially on TV and going, wait a second. Let me understand the big picture as much as I can so I can analyze it to verify. As, as, as I heard one guy say before, trust, but verify. And that's what we're doing here. We're trusting, but we're verifying by going back and looking at the author. So, the birthmark, okay? Very gothic piece. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a weird um, kind of a story. Uh, for most people, especially new students that are coming into the college um, in the academic environment. But there's a reason for it, and there is applicability to the modern age, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Even though this story was written back in the early part of the uh, 19th century, which is the 1800s, uh, a lot, some of the themes and the motifs are really applicable today, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So first thing that I want to do when I'm analyzing this work I want to look at Nathaniel Hawthorne, okay? He is the person that wrote it. So to understand his work, you need to understand him. Now, Nathaniel Hawthorne grew up in and was born and raised in, in the New England area of the country, okay? If you know anything about your American history, which I'm sad to say I know less of than I do British history and uh, European history, um, but I'm getting there. Nathaniel Hawthorne, grew up in an area of the country uh, and and a time in the country, where have you heard this before? Time and place. Um, Where you had some leftover vestiges from the the ancestors that came before them. A lot of the cultural norms were still in place. um, Even 150, 200 years removed from Hawthorne's time. Okay? Hawthorne, like I said, he grew up in the Massachusetts area. Uh, of New England, his ancestors were directly involved in the Salem Witch Trials. So if you know anything about the Salem Witch Trials, you know that some of the first settlers that, that, that from Europe that came into this country formed colonies up in the New England area, and a lot of these were Puritans, okay, who came from England who were devoutly religious. All of this stuff carries over from King Henry VIII's time when he was on the throne back in the 16th, um, 15th century. Um, and uh, some of the decisions he made about religion, uh, breaking from the Church of Rome. Uh, Then you also have the Protestant Reformation that was thrown into that, some of the Protestant um, ideals and and beliefs and theological conceits um, that really changed people's outlook on religion in Europe. A lot of these people came over um, because they were ostracized, in in England at the time, uh, they were considered to be the party poopers. These were the people you did not want to come to a party because they did not have fun no matter what. All right, they just sat around. They would drink water, and instead of getting up and dancing with everybody else, they would just sit off in a corner and, you know, maybe have a leg thrown up on the other leg and just kind of they they wouldn't even shake their leg when the music was playing. Okay, these people were not fun at all, um, and so. They were extremely religious. I mean, zealots at, at really is is the uh, most accurate way that you can describe them. Very zealot. Um, they uh, believed in strict social norms that uh, many people today would consider to be oppressive, especially when it came to women, um, and. Anytime somebody stepped out of line, immediately a lot of these Puritans, especially the Puritanical leaders, 
uh, always wanted to lay blame on something. And of course, during this time, uh, Satan or the devil was usually the the, the uh, scapegoat when it came to describing why people do what they do. Okay, so the devil made them do it. Um, and it got to the point where they became so infatuated with that uh, that thought that some people were put on trial for being devil worshippers or witches during this time. Um, so Hawthorne's ancestors were directly involved in that. Um, and looking back on that time period um, and, and the effects that it had on the cultural norms even within the time he lived in, he saw some, ne- you know, of course, he still saw the negative effects of that. And I think one of the reasons, of course, we can't we can't talk to Hawthorne now and say, hey, man, why did you write all these these dreary, dark pieces um, about American life in the early 1800s? But I would be willing to say, again, I'm not a I'm not a scholar, uh, an American scholar, but I have read opinion pieces, which most scholars believe that the reason why he wrote these pieces is because he was trying to make up uh, for what his ancestors had done and the social norms and the religious norms and cultural norms uh, that were put in place in, in New England at the time. He was really wanting to bring them to the forefront and to talk about them and explain what the effects of those norms were. Okay, So in a nutshell, that's who Hawthorne was. He was someone who uh, was very opinionated about the cultural um, environment around him, and he wanted to do something about it. And the, the way that he uh, went about that was to write stories which really highlighted the human condition um, in New England at the time as a result of the Puritan um, colonization of the Americas, which took place 150, 200 years before that. Okay, so now let's get into the book, The Birthmark. So, having talked a little bit about Hawthorne, now we can look at the birthmark in the and the text, looking at some of these analytical elements that we talked about before. So let's let's look at the characters. Okay, what type of characters do we have uh, in this story? Well, of course, you have Almer, who is this scientific? Um, he's kind of like the Bill Nye of the 1800s. Okay. Uh, when when I was reading the story, he he was the Bill Nye was the person that kind of popped into my mind um, as as what this person possibly looked like, um, and and all I could do is I could see this, you know, Bill. I really I, I did I, I just saw Bill Nye the whole time. So Almer Almer is this 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 guy who was um, obsessed with perfection. Okay, and he believed that the natural world around him could achieve perfection if a scientific application was, um, or some kind of scientific principle was applied to the problem present in nature that and, and could solve it using some kind of scientific principle. So, um, you can immediately in the story kind of get a feel for who this guy is he's someone who is very analytical uh he's obsessed with perfection uh he believes that nature can be conquered by mankind using scientific experiments and principles and uh theories and stuff so you kind of get a you, you get a really good feel for who he is um let me get my notes here one second um, so now let's move on to the other main character, which is Georgiana, his love. So Georgiana is this young girl. She's quite a bit younger than, than Almer is. She's the exact opposite. Okay. She's not very analytical. Uh, she's not very active. Okay. What I mean is, by that is she's not someone who's a very assertive, dominant personality like Almer is. Uh, she's very passive. And... Um, one of the reasons for that is because she has this uh, birthmark. Uh, this is my yeah. This is my left side. So she has this birthmark on her cheek. Okay, and she so, of course that makes her self-conscious because she's got something 
that that was natural to her face uh that did not look like everyone else and it made her self-conscious okay we all have those tendencies right there's always all of us have something about our bodies or you know whether it's our face or um our legs or our arms or whatnot things that we just don't like about like me right here my nose i i don't know how that is being you know an Irish guy and part Native American. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how that comes about. That's, you know, these, these we all have these things, right? So um, the birthmark for Georgiana was a symbol of uh, an insecurity, okay? And it made her quite passive. Um, so we've got this two main characters in the store, and then we also have this other one, uh, Aminadab, uh, who is Almer's assistant, and he plays a part in this as well. He is uh, more of a constant static character, okay? You know who he is up front? He says who he is up front, and he doesn't change, okay? Uh, and he is the type of character who is almost the opposite of his, uh, his boss, okay? Um, he, he's fascinated by science. Uh, he loves to help. Almer in his scientific experiments, but he's not willing to use them uh, to bring about this um, pursuit of perfection. Okay, so now we've got these three characters in this story. Let's go back to Almer real quick because I want to talk about this notion of perfection. Perfection and imperfection. Where it kind of goes back to the cave again. Okay, our perceptions of what is real what is not real, what is perfect, and what is not perfect, okay? So we all have these tendencies where we build up these things in our mind and these plans and these, these, these images of how we want things to be. And in our mind, oh, wow, that seems to be perfect, right? But then we try to bring those into reality. Nature and time tend to have a certain effect where the plans don't always work out or we don't always get the result that we're wanting, right so our pursuit to change that perspective which we have which is we see something that's imperfect we want to make it perfect and sometimes in in at the end we end up making it even less perfect than what it was had we left it alone okay so almer's this kind of type of character all right so what happens now that we've talked about the characters, what what are the what what are the actions here? Well, you've got this instance to where this Bill Nye type scientist ends up with the most beautiful girl, or what is perceived to be the most beautiful girl in in the neighborhood, the village, uh, who happens to have this slight imperfection. Side note. All of the other guys who, the suitors who came to, to win her hand, none of them had a problem with who she was or how she looked. In fact, some of them commented that it was the fairy's hand that laid upon her cheek. You know, that it was a nice little touch. One second. But no, not Almer. Right? We know who Almer is because of this character. It's not good enough. Yes, you are beautiful. Yes, I love you or I love my idea of you. But who you are is not good enough. I alone can make you good enough. Okay? So without going, and, and I'm not going to create a bunch of spoilers here. I just want to talk about the work from an analytical point of view, because um, I'm sure some of you have not read the work yet. But what we have is is a conflict. We have Georgiana, who is what she is, in a relationship with a man who, despite loving her, can't accept her for who she is. She must change and conform to be what he wants her to be. He can't accept the reality of what he's viewing on the wall. 
He has to change it and make it perfect based on the image that he sees within his head. Okay? So he's taking Plato's theory a step further. He can't even accept the distorted view that he sees on the wall. He's only worried about what he sees up here. He doesn't care what's going on in reality. He only cares about here. Okay? So now he's got this God complex. I will change everything, all the whole world that is perfect and imperfect. I will bend it to my will and make it what I want because my ideal or my idea of perfection is much better than everyone else's. Okay? That gets into a little bit of his character motivation, but it creates conflict at the same time because here you have this lovely person, this sweet soul in Georgiana who desperately wants to please her husband. And she can't do that unless she removes this one natural quote-unquote imperfection on her face, something that she had no control over. It was given to her by at birth by nature. No control of it. But she's willing to do whatever it takes to change it. Because if you really look at that birthmark, okay, that birthmark, quote unquote, is a physical flaw. But at the same time, Hawthorne is stating, according to the perception, that it is also a spiritual flaw. Okay? Now, is it a spiritual flaw that exists within Georgiana? Maybe. I'll let you read the text and figure that out for yourself because that could be a, a, a topic for the paper. Or is it a spiritual flaw that exists within Almer? I'll throw you another curveball. Is it a spiritual flaw that it exists in both? Okay. A good topic for discussion in the discussion board and for your essay. Okay. Now, theme. Uh, well, no, no, hold on. Let's get back to plot. So, this conflict has arisen between Almer and Georgiana being a scientist um, he wants to correct the imperfection Georgiana resists at first but then finally she gives in and so they go about conducting a series of experiments in order to remove this quote unquote imperfection from her face so that Almer can finally embrace within his wife what he knows is there, which is that sweet perfection. Not created by nature, but created by himself. And because of that, some drastic, some bad things happen. As you know they would be, because that's a foreshadowing, right? Whenever someone attempts to change another person by force, whether it's physically or through manipulation, which in this case it definitely was manipulation, psychological torture, bad things happen. Okay? Bad things happen. Um, and unfortunately for jo Georgiana, bad things did happen. Now, what I want you to do is go through the story and see what happens to Georgiana. Talk about how it made you feel what it made you think. More importantly, what is Almer's reaction? It'll shock you. But, if you really understand puritanical theology and philosophy, it doesn't, it shouldn't shock you. It's pretty par on for course. Okay? Um, and then the themes, okay? The themes of, that are present within the story very, really, I think, are extremely apl applicable today, okay? More so now than ever. 
mainly because of social media. Social media has created almost a new Puritan mindset in that people have to think a certain way, they have to look a certain way, they have to act a certain way. Um, there is no room for anybody to uh, express an individual point of view that's separate, especially on Twitter. Uh, not so much Facebook, but Twitter. Man, you can be you can be harassed to death, literally, uh, for stepping out of line on Twitter. Um, and that platform has created a what I think of as a new puritanical philosophy and conceit that everyone should adhere to this new ideal this new form of perfection and if you if you express any type of individualism at all you're going to be ostracized for it okay you must look a certain way especially for the ladies you must look a certain way be a certain thing act a certain way um and we're not so much i mean yeah it, it's it's mainly socially engineered towards the ladies but i mean even for men um step out of line man you're going to get crucified on there too um so it's very similar to some of the motifs that are present within hawthorne's work this ideal of what is perfect what is the perfect representation of being human um physically spiritually emotionally It's 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 it, it's very interesting. It, it just popped into my mind. It's something I'm going to explore uh, further. Okay, so uh, like I said, I don't want to do a plot spoiler here. Um, spoiler alert! No, I don't. I don't. I'm not about that. Uh, and unfortunately, if we were in the classroom, I would have a class day set aside so that we could sit down and really talk about from beginning to end. Um, what happens in the story but what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave that for the discussion board okay because I'm going to be actively participating in that as well um, I'm going to make an attempt to answer each and every one of your discussion board posts uh, what I encourage you to do is also to engage with your fellow students and talk about some things that really stand out in your mind about the work that's being discussed um, especially if you have some differing point of views Remember, we're all in this cave. We're all chained to the wall. We're all viewing the same image on the wall, but we all have different thoughts about what that image is. Okay? So I want you to discuss it. Uh, and I'll be on there to help you with that. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry this video ran about 53 minutes. Um, close to 55 minutes. Um, I had a lot to talk about, a lot to catch up on. Um, so... Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was possibility. I'm exploring the uh, options that I have out there to hosting a live classroom environment from time to time. Um, if you guys are interested in that, definitely please drop me a comment below. Let me know if you're interested in uh, having some type of live classroom environment. I'm not comfortable with Zoom. Uh, I know that the college use, utilizes Zoom for a lot of their meetings and a lot of their classroom environments. Um, again, my primary job is on Eglin, and uh, all I can tell you is that's not a good thing to do. Um, so I'm looking at some alternatives out there. I know Google has um, an option out there called uh, Google Meet or something like that, and of course Facebook. I really don't care for Facebook, uh, but I'll look at the different options out there. If you if you guys have some recommendations, uh, something outside of Zoom that people are using, maybe some of your other professors, uh, definitely drop me a line, uh, a comment below. Uh, also, give me some feedback on this video. Um, let me know. Let me know what you like, what you don't like. I'm I'm very flexible. I'm very dynamic. If there's some some things that are, that are working, um, I'll I tend to focus on those a little more. Um, if if some things are kind of interrupting the video, please let me know. I'll change that. Uh, I'm all about you know making these videos better because at the end of the day, this is about you. It's not about me. Um, 
So please, if you have any ideas, comments, suggestions on how I can improve my videos, uh, definitely drop me a line below. Let me know what you think. And um, so again, uh, before I get off the video, we have a discussion board post that is due uh, this Sunday um, on Hawthorne's uh, The Birthmark. Uh, if you have not gotten your textbook yet, uh, please contact the bookstore to inquire about a digital version. If you're not able to obtain a digital version while you're waiting for your textbook to come in, um, I will let you know there are plenty of sites out there um, which have a copy of the, the birthmark. Now, I can't guarantee that it's the official version, uh, the, the, the uh, critical version that's accepted by the Academy, uh, but it should be pretty close. Okay, and that will that will allow you to at least keep up keep up the pace, stay engaged, and um, that, that you know until your textbook arrives. Okay, if you have issues um, uh, or need some help or assistance in getting that textbook, please um, drop me a line of email, or uh, you guys have my cell phone number. Please shoot me a text or give me a phone call, whichever one you prefer and reach out to me and let me know how I can help you, okay? All right, guys, so that, that'll end the video for this week. Uh, again, we talked about the literary elements. We talked about Hawthorne uh, at, a, at a very high level. Um, I will see you guys next week. We will talk about Toni Morrison, the wonderful Toni Morrison. We'll talk about her piece, Recitative, and uh, how to utilize some of these elements when analyzing her her piece as well okay so you guys um stay up to date uh stay on top of the hawthorne go ahead and get that out of the way and go ahead and prepare to read uh morrison's recitative um at least at least get halfway through it uh, and by the time i drop the video next week which will probably be around uh tuesday or wednesday um you'll be you'll be up to speed what we're talking about all right you guys take care stay safe uh, stay at home as much as you can and, uh, we'll see you guys next week. Take care.